for the hastening of the return of our 12th Imam, Imam al Hujjah, one salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. My dear brothers and sisters in Iman, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As we continue in this period of grieving that we commemorate the tragedy of Karbala, and as we know that as a community of believers, we don't only commemorate the first 10 or 12 days of the tragedy of Karbala. For us, it goes well beyond that period. It goes up until the day of Arba'in, and even well beyond that, many communities congregate and remember the tragedy up to the day of Eid al-Zahra, on the 9th of Rabi'ul Awwal. But for these days that we are here, and we are going through this tragedy and remembering the supreme sacrifice of Sayyid al-Shuhada, for this Thursday and for the following, uh, for the next few Thursday nights that we are together, I want to look at this concept of the ziyarat. Because obviously we know that many of us will be going for the ziyarat of Arba'in in a few weeks' time. Many of us have been there in the past. Many of us tried to make it a point to go to ziyarat, to visit and pay our respects to Rasulullah in Medina, to the family of the Prophet who are buried in Mecca, and obviously Iraq and Iran and Syria, and obviously those other regions where the family of the Prophet are buried. I want to try and analyze and understand that how is this concept of a ziyarat? What is the basis of it from within the religion of Islam? I don't want to go into the polemics of trying to debate and uh, prove that it is a tradition or it is a practice within Islam because I would say at the outset that 99.9% .9 of the Muslim ummah, every Muslim in the world with the exception of a few very narrow-minded Muslims would accept the concept of ziyarat. You ask any of the Muslims of the world today that do you accept the concept of visiting the grave of Rasulullah? And nobody would deny the fact that there is barakah, there is reward to visit the grave of Rasulullah, to pay his, our, our respects to the grave of the Prophet, to pay our respects rather to the Prophet. Nobody would deny that fact. Muslims throughout the centuries, since the time of Rasulullah, we were all in agreement that to visit the graves of not only the Prophet, but family members, other individuals, has always been a practice that was accepted in Islam, that the Prophet himself confirmed that the ayat of the Quran never came to denounce. And so rather than look at trying to validate it because we all accept this practice, I want to look at more at the philosophy of the ziyarat, the etiquette of it. And I have about four sessions that we will have from this week until the period of Arba'in. And so I want to look at it in four different stages. Tonight I want to just look at the introduction to ziyarat. What is this concept of visiting those who have passed and left this world? And some of the benefits which the hadith speak about. We also want to go in our next discussion to look at some important ziyarat that we have within our books. And also some key passages, especially related to the ziyarat of Arba'in. Because obviously those who will be preparing to go for the ziyarat of Sayyidu Shuhada on Chalum on the 40th, they will be reciting this special ziyarat given to us. And we'll see how in that particular text, how the uh, event of Karbala is displayed and how also our connection to the event of Karbala should also be maintained within our day-to-day -day life. And then we'll conclude our discussions by looking at the etiquette of ziyarat. The physical as well as the spiritual. Because yes, it is a physical journey to go from here to Najaf. Let's say for those who are walking from Najaf to Karbala is a physical excursion. But as much as it being a physical journey, it is also a spiritual journey towards obviously the individuals whom Allah has put in charge and to safeguard and protect this religion. Before I go to the main theme, I just want to remind us of a hadith that we have, because again, people will say, well, do we have examples in the statements of Rasul where he would have encouraged people 
to go and visit the graves. And yes, as we say that we have multiple hadith. It's not just one or two, but many of our books. For example, you can refer to the book Kamil al-Ziyarat, which is available in English also online. You can download the PDF. This book written by one of our great scholars, it has literally thousands of hadith on the fadilat, on the merits of the ziyarat of each of the infallibles, alayhim was salam. And so it's not a question of doubting or questioning the validity or authenticity of the ziyarat. We are past that stage, hopefully. It is now to understand and better appreciate the role of the visitation when we pay our respects to the Prophet and his noble family. So we have just one hadith I'll begin with tonight where the infallibles have been quoted as saying that visit the graves of your deceased ones and greet them as in this both the visiting of them and greeting them there is a lesson for you to learn. Without a doubt and I'll look at a few different uh, angles of the ziyarats of who we visit but generally speaking, when we go to the grave, whether it be our local cemetery here in our own city, or we go maybe back home where maybe our family members or our parents are buried, or we go to the shrines of the Prophet or the family of the Prophet, all of these, there are multiple reasons why we go through this journey. There are multiple reasons why we partake and undertake such experiences. But as the hadith says from Rasulullah, one of the prime lessons or one of the prime outcomes of this visitation is for us to learn an example. Right? Learn an example of what? Learn an example that just as these great men and women lived on this earth, when they are called back by Allah, there are no exceptions to that rule. You go and you look at the grave of Rasulullah as an example, or Amirul Mu'mineen, people who were representatives of Allah on this earth, but yet when their time came, Allah took them back. You look at people who are multi-millionaires, billionaires around the world, and you go to their grave, and guess what? It's the exact same size as the grave of a poor person. There is no differentiation between the graves of the rich or the poor. Maybe if they have you know, mausoleums or, you know, things built over the grave, but the actual hole in the ground is the same for everybody. And so when we begin with that understanding that the visitation to the graves should be a lesson for us that we are not going to be here forever. We are transitory individuals. We are transitory creations of God. That our time will be coming to a close. Our, our lifespan is fixed and that it's about our actions, what we take with us, then these visitations to the graves will hopefully crystallize in our mind that, you know what, all of these things that we fight for in the world, power, authority, the right to rule, wealth, all of these things become trivial at the end of the day. They become immaterial because at the end of the day, we're all going back to the same location, which is obviously back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When our scholars look at this concept of the ziyarat, they tell us at one level that there are at least five different categories that we will go to visit, different individuals. And they all have their own benefit within our lives. Now this isn't based on hadith directly or, more or specifically, but it's based on our understanding of the Quran and our purpose in life. So at the very first level is our family members. Right? When in the hadith, we are actually told that even our family members who have passed away, they still have a haq or a right upon us. And that right is to go and visit them in the graveyard. And so, for example, we have hadith that we're told that a person who wants to do good to their mother or father, birrul walidain, if they're alive, obviously they help them, they're at their service. But when they pass away, the hadith say that you go to their grave and you pray for their forgiveness. And that is being showing kindness to your parents, even if they've passed away. It's also a tradition that is within the teachings of Islam. So as an example, we have multiple hadith from all of the Muslims that after uh, the major battles, for example, the battle of Uhud, when the Prophet's uncle was killed, and we know that his liver or his heart was taken out, and Hind tried to chew that. 
and he was buried. We are told that Lady Zahra salam, Baby Fatima salam, that she would go to the graveyard at least once a week and sit at the grave of Sayyidu Shuhada Hamza and she would cry and she would make dua for him. So there is a tradition of the Ahlul Bayt and Islam tradition of visiting the graves. In fact, even the tasbih that we use, these tasbihs that we count the name of Allah, Allahu Akbar, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, this was actually created initially by Bibi Fatima alayhi salam. We call it the tasbih of Lady Zahra as we know as a Muslim community. But initially what they would do is they would take a piece of string and tie knots in that string. What ended up happening is that Bibi Fatima took dirt from the cover of her uncle Sayyidu Shuhada Hamza and she made little beads out of that. And she made the tasbih using the dirt of his grave. And that's where we also have the tradition of, for example, when we go to Karbala, we buy tasbihs with the dirt of Karbala. This was uh, not an innovation, this was a practice that was, instrument, that was implemented by Bibi Fatima alayhi salam. This using beads on a string to count the names of Allah. So when we go to the grave of our family members, it's a right that they have upon us. We're told in the hadith, that when you cry over the ones who have left this world from your family, you are fulfilling the right of that deceased person. And when you show patience, when you come to the realization that we all have to die, and you remember the fact that Allah has, all, has instrumented this concept of death, and you have patience, sabr, hadith says that now you have fulfilled the right of Allah. We even have traditions where when Rasulullah's son Ibrahim passed away, few months old he passes away and he goes to the grave he himself digs the grave to bury his own son with his own hands he puts the body in the grave he covers it up and he cries and one of the sahaba one of the companions at that time says ya rasulullah i thought we heard you say you don't cry over the deceased and the prophet replied to this man saying i've never said that I've said that when you cry and show emotions, you don't go to excess. You don't beat yourself. You don't rip your clothes. But he says to show emotion, to cry when a, a loved one has passed away, this is a natural human reaction. And Islam being a religion of human nature, it expects us when we lose a loved one to show that level of reverence and cry and shed tears over the loss of a family member. Muslims of the community, we have members of our own community who pass away. What benefit is it to go and pray Fatiha for them? Surely they have their own family members who will remember them. But no, we're told that when we go to the graveyard and we do the ziyarat of the Ahlul Qubur as we go to our own graveyard here and we have a beautiful plaque with a specific ziyarat we recite for Ahlul Qubur where we go and welcome and we greet them and we salute them we also get a chance to remember those people and maybe a contribution that they made to our community. Maybe we go to the graveyard and we see people who were pioneers in our community, who established these buildings, who put together programs, who in some way were instrumental. And they have a right over us as well because they established these institutions. So when we pay our respects to them, we are doing so because of the fact that they have left behind this legacy of our centers, our majalis, these gatherings that we have. And then when we go to the grave of our ulama, for example, you go to Qum, to the haram of Sayyidah Masuma alayhi salam, and you have probably no less than 20 maraja taqlid and major scholars buried in her shrine. People like the late Ayatollah Burujardi, maybe many of the elderly in our community had done taqlid of this great maraja in the 1960s. You have giants of the Islamic world like Alama Tabatabai, like Shaheed Murtada Mutahari, like Ayatollah Bahjad, Ayatollah Gulpegani, Ayatollah Araki, so many other maraja. And when we go to their grave, we remember the sacrifices that they have done, their intellectual struggles, their you know, works that we benefit from today. Today when we read, for example, Al-Mizan of Alama Tabatabai, and we go to his grave in Qum, we remind ourselves that he spent 40 years of his life writing one book, one compilation of co commentary of the Quran, Al-Mizan. 
So it becomes a reminder of the scholarship of Islam and what they have done to preserve this religion over the eras. When we go to the graves of the shuhada, the martyrs, for example in Karbala or any of the other sacred shrines where the companions of the prophets and the imams are buried, we bring about this realization that this religion has been preserved through the blood of many, many people who have had to give their lives to protect Islam. You know, we don't have that problem today. You won't find a person who here today in our societies will lose their life, or very few perhaps, for the preservation of Islam. But when you look at what happened in the history of Islam up until even current times, we see that no, these shuhada, these martyrs, they gave their lives for the sake of the religion. So when we visit their grave, we are reminded of the concept of self-sacrifice that we give of ourselves just as they did for the preservation of their norm, their, of their values and what they believed in. And obviously when we come to Rasul and the family of the Prophet, we are going, realizing that they have given the ultimate in terms of sacrifice, that were it not for them, were it not for the Prophet and his 23 years of struggles, were it not for Amir al-Mu'mineen and his challenges he faced all the way from the time of coming into Islam at birth up until the time of his martyrdom, that again, we would not be where we are today. And so all of these individuals, when we reflect on why we go to where they're buried, whether it be locally in our own cemetery or we go thousands of kilometers away, they all have a purpose that should instill something within our own thoughts of why we're making these journeys. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. People may say, well, what is there in the Quran about this? Because we always want to understand religious concepts from the Quranic narrative. As I said, the Quran is almost silent on the concept of ziyarat, of going to the graves of individuals. There are two exceptions to this rule. I'll just share one of them with us tonight which comes from us in Surah Tawbah, comes to us from Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse 84. Now, the context behind this verse is that the Prophet, at the time of the early community, they had the concept, obviously, of burying people who died in the battles, just as we have today. But there were people who were outwardly Muslims, but as we know, in their heart, they were against the religion, what we call the hypocrites, the munafiqun. And so the, Allah wanted to make it known to the Prophet that you can go to the graves of certain people, but there are certain individuals whom you should not pray over. You should not make the namaz janaza over. You don't have to go to their grave and pray for forgiveness for them, and so on and so forth. And so Allah told the Prophet, وَلَا تُسَلِّ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَاتَىٰ that nor should you ever offer the funeral prayer for any of these people, these hypocrites, when they die, nor stand at the grave of any of them and pray for forgiveness for them. Because, as Allah says, they disbelieved in Allah and the Messenger and died in a state of disobedience. So we have this understanding that things like praying for the forgiveness of the deceased is for the Muslims. You know, sometimes people say, this good non-Muslim passed away, this Christian died, can I go and pray for them? Can I make istighfar for them? Can I do all of these actions? Obviously, when we look at it from one aspect, you can realize that prayers are for the individual. They are directed to Allah, but for the individual. If a person is against the religion of Allah, then it would obviously stand to reason that prayers for them would be of no benefit. So that doesn't mean that you just judge everybody because many times we don't know what's in the heart of people. We don't know where people believers or not. But when we know that a person was definitely a non-believer and people have asked, can we have a Surah Fatiha for such and such a person? They were a humanitarian. They were a good person. Well, if they were good, as Allah says, that in Allah, لا يُذِيُوا أَجْرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Allah will not waste the reward of the good doers. Allah will recompense the people who did good. There's no doubt about it. Muslim, Christian, Jew, atheist, whatever they were, if they were good, Allah will reward them. 
But as believers, we have a limit of where we have certain practices that we have to follow. And one of them obviously is in terms of death and those ceremonies. So Allah told the Prophet, don't pray over them. Don't stand at their grave. Don't ask istighfar for them because they were people who rebelled against the rules of Allah. Showing us the opposite is valid. As Allah does this many times, He'll give us a concept which is not allowed, but the opposite is allowed. So you have people who are righteous, people who are believers, people who were on the path of the religion of Islam. Obviously for those, there is the permissibility to pray. We know that it is uh, highly recommended to perform, for example, the, or be present in the janazah prayer when a person of our community passes away. We should try our best to take off work if we can, leave school if that's uh, you know, a possibility, and attend the janazah. It's highly recommended to take part in the prayers, go to the graveyard, be present in that event. And obviously to pray for them, we have this, um, you know, namaz hadiya mayyat, salatul wahsha, all of these different prayers, to remember that individual that Allah would lighten any difficulties that they may be facing in the period of the barzakh. Let me go to the concept of ziyarat for the last few minutes that I have remaining for tonight. Is that what is this ziyarat that we do? Whether it's here from home, or we travel thousands of kilometers away, what is this concept and philosophy of ziyarat? Is ziyarat just a visitation by the tongue? Is it just to open the book or the app and to recite a few lines, peace be upon you, O Abba Abdullah, and we go on and on and on, and we just read it without understanding, is that all a ziyarat is? Or is it with the body and the tongue? So we travel thousands of kilometers away, and we are physically in their presence, and then we recite those words. Or is it something much more profound and deeper, where it's the physical at one level perhaps, but it's the verbal declaration, and it's also the focus with our heart and our soul. Meaning that we try and emulate and follow the example of those people that we're going to pay respects to. So we go to our local graveyard, we see a community member who was, let's say, a president or a treasurer or somebody in the community who was active in some aspect of our community. Do we just go and say the ziyarat and we leave? Or do we think that why was this person so loved in the community? What positive change did they bring about that we remember them? Right? And when we look at ziyarat of whether it's our family, our friends, our community, the Ahlul Bayt, the Shuhada, the Ulama, when we look at it in that light, then the ziyarat becomes actually a transformative event. It becomes something that we can change our lives based on. And maybe as a side note, maybe this is why people like Saddam, maybe it's people like him forbade the ziyarat of Sayyid the Shuhada alayhi salam. Because if ziyarat was just to go to Karbala and say hello to the Imam and then go home, people like Saddam and Bani Abbas who had, forbid, who had forbade the ziyarat, they wouldn't have a problem with it. But they realized that when you go to the grave of Abba Abdullah and you hold on to the dhari, you are going to think about what happened on the day of Ashura. And you're going to think about why Imam Hussein took a stand against Yazid. And that would hopefully change you as an individual to resist oppression, to not be oppressive in your personal life. And maybe that's why these governments kept the ziyarat under control because they realized that if people were to reflect on the ziyarat in this way, that it should change our lives, that that would cause the downfall of their own governments. Maybe that's why even today, when you go to Jannatul Baqi, the Saudis have to put a 30-foot wall around a graveyard. There's nothing to steal in a graveyard. What are you going to steal? Rocks? Dirt? Right? There's nothing to steal. But yet they probably have more security in Jannatul Baqi than most shopping centers have. Right? They got cameras, those security guards that walk around with, and, and they're ready to arrest you. A big wall with you know, those spikes at the top of it. Why are you scared of people who are dead? or who are apparently dead, what, what, what frightens them of people that you have to put so much protection around a graveyard? If it wasn't for the fact that they realized that this 
movement of ziyarat can change the individuals when you're physically there, they wouldn't go through all of these efforts to safeguard, you know, a few graves in, in Medina. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <clears throat> so what is the meaning of ziyarat? The root word of this very beautiful concept the, 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 the source of Islamic literature where this word comes from is the word Zor. Now Zor in Arabic is interesting because it's used in the Quran in six different instances. Allah uses it six, different, uh, six times but in three different meanings. The v most prominent meaning of this word or the root word in the Quran is to lie, to not tell the truth. So Allah says for example, وَجْتَنِبُوا قَوْلَ Zor. وَجْتَنِبُوا قَوْلَ Zor rather. Keep away from lying. Now why would a lie be used with the same word as ziyarat? Because a lie, and we'll see in the definition of ziyarat, a lie is where you deflect away from the truth. Where the truth is here, or falsehood is here. When you utter a lie, you're going away from truth, going towards falsehood, going towards battle. So one of the meanings of the root word is to tell a lie. And Allah uses this four times in the Quran. It also means to turn around. So you know sometimes you're in bed sleeping and you turn on your left and your right and you're not comfortable. The same concept of Zur is how Allah defines Ashabul Kahf, the people of the cave. When they're sleeping, Allah says you would see them turning on the right, turning on the left, turning back, turning forth. Because they're turning back and forth, this same word for Ziyarat is also used. The only time Allah uses it in our discussion that I want to look at tonight is when you go to the grave, that's in Surah Al-Takathur, where Allah says, Al-Hakamu Al-Takathur, Hatta Zurtumul Maqabir, until you go and visit the graves. And there is a negative connotation, I won't go into that commentary tonight, but that was a negative connotation that Allah used for Ziyarat because of the negative reason why the pre-Islamic Arabs would go to the graveyards. But to sum up just one point is that when we look at ziyarat and going to the graveyard, this is neither an act of shirk, of associating partners with Allah, nor is it a bidda or an innovation in the religion that the Prophet never did. We can say it's not shirk or associating partners because this is one of the accusations that people like the Salafis, like the Wahhabis, they give on all Muslims that they say when you go to the grave of the Prophet or your Imams, you're doing shirk. But we say no, we're not worshipping the grave. We're not worshipping the person in the grave. We're not worshipping the dhari around them. We're not worshipping the golden dome. We are going there to pay our respects to that individual. We're not worshipping them. And if you look, and we look at this in our upcoming discussions, the text of all of our ziyarat, we're told, for example, start with the bismillah. Start with the tasbih of Lady Zahra. Say Allahu Akbar. We have a two rakat namaz we're told to pray. Who are we praying the namaz to? It's to Allah. Allahu Akbar. We start with the name of Allah. We end with Allah. So ziyarat is nothing about shirk. It has nothing to do with us associating Imam Ali or Imam Hussein or Abu Fadl Abbas salam with Allah. We realize that they are not God. They are... Obviously, the, they are the servants, we can say, of Rasulullah. We don't worship the Prophet. We don't worship the Imams. We go to these graves to remind us of all of these things I just had spoken about. Nor is it a bidda. This is not something that we have brought about. As I mentioned, that Rasulullah would visit the grave of his son. He visited the grave of his mother when he came back after Fatah of Makkah. This is a tradition that was implemented in the latter days of Islam. The Ahlul Bayt salam, would practice it because it was a human emotion to go and remember people who have left this world. So what are some of the benefits of the ziyarat as we conclude? One of them is obviously spiritual proximity to Allah. Because as I said, when we go for the ziyarat, it's not about that person in and of itself. It's about remembering Allah and why Allah sent that person. So when we go for ziyarah, and again when we look at the, some of the lines in, in the passages, we'll see how the ziyarahs are directed to Allah. The words are about Allah, about Allah's you know, messengers that He had sent. 
the movements that were established through people like the Ahlul Bayt. It also should bring about a change in our character. Right? We're going far away. We will make sure our prayers are on time. We're going to be eating halal. We'll be helping other people. Uh, we're going to be changing, you know, albeit temporarily, but at least we're changing for that little short period. And hopefully we can continue that when we come back home. And obviously one of the greatest reasons why we go for ziyarat is our hajat, our needs, what we have problems in our lives. We have challenges. We all have, you know, health issues, financial, marital, uh, with our children. We have all of these challenges. And sometimes we feel, well, I can make dua right here from home. But if I go to Karbala, under the Golden Dome, where all my duas are accepted, maybe I'll have a better chance. Just like we're told on Arafat to be in Arafat. Just like we're told on, in certain times and places, duas are, are more readily accepted. You know, and we have an example in the life of our 10th Imam, Imam Al-Hadi alayhi salatu wasalam. We have an example where one time he fell sick in Samara. And Samara to Karbala is not a far distance. But because he was under political pressure, he couldn't necessarily just up and leave and travel where he wanted. So one day he asked his companions, he asked, is any of you going to Karbala? Or can any of you even go to Karbala? And the companions were sort of wondering, well, what request would the Imam have? And he says that, I'm not feeling well. I've been sick for a period of time. Can one of you go to Karbala and make dua for me under the, or you know, near the shrine of my grandfather, Sayyid al-Shuhada? Now it sounds a bit strange. An imam, the 10th imam, asking a normal human being like you and I to go to Karbala to pray for him. Why can't the imam just pray where he is in Samara? He's the imam, the proof of Allah. Surely the imam's du'as are accepted. But he, maybe he wanted to show us that the power of Karbala is such that even another infallible imam is asking others to take his du'as to the grave of Abu Abdullah alayhi salam. And so when we see our imams making this request and asking people, I'll pay you, go to Karbala just to make du'a for me, it should show you and I the power of Karbala. It's not a normal city. Right? And we know that Karbala is so unique that the earth of Karbala, we make sajda, we prostrate on that. All the turbas that we get, or majority are from Karbala. We can get turba from Qom, from Mashhad, from Syria, from Najaf. But we don't have fatwa that it's mustahab to do sajda on dirt of Najaf, or Mecca, or Medina. It's mustahab to do sajda on the earth of Karbala. So it's unique. It's a unique place, and we look at that in our future discussions. But it's unique, and we have to appreciate that Allah has put some unique qualities and characteristics in that specific land. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I'll end with one last point, which is that when we have this ziyarah, when we go to the graves of the Prophet and the Imams, one of the things that we see within most of the, the, the ziyarahs that we recite is a term where we say, Arifan bihaqqihi. That we're uh, paying our respects to the Prophet or Lady Zahra or the Imams, knowing their right and their status with Allah. And this really makes the entire difference, where it becomes not just a body and a, a physical and a verbal ziyarah, but it is a spiritual journey, where our heart is being realigned towards that individual. What is to know the right? How do we know the right of the people that we are visiting? Our scholars tell us three points, and I'll end with this tonight, is that we know, first of all, and we have to know and believe that the imam or the prophet or whoever we are paying our respects to in terms of the infa infa infallibles have been appointed by Allah. That's important, to know that they're appointed. They're not just good people that we should follow or that we should love. Number two is that we need to believe and accept that their obedience is obligatory upon us. Right? So they're no, they didn't just come that we can beat our chest in Muharram and wear black and do these rituals. No, they came for us to obey them, to follow their teachings, to implement what it is that they had brought from Rasul, from Allah. 
And last but not least is that we need to realize that our entire lifestyle needs to change to fit into the mold of what they expect from us. Our thoughts need to change. Our speech, how we talk and what we say should reflect the speech of the Ahlul Bayt. And obviously our actions should be a representation of that individual we're going to visit. And if we are lacking in these, then we won't say that the ziyarat is null and void, but it would definitely be deficient. It wouldn't have all of the rewards and merits which the hadith tell us. For example, 1,000 hajj, 1,000 umrah for one ziyarat, or the shafat on the day of judgment from the ahlul bayt. And inshallah, as we continue to develop this theme of the philosophy and wisdom of ziyarat, we'll see how not only is it a... Uh, 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 opportunity to change ourselves religiously but also in many other aspects of our lives including on a social and a political platform sallu ala muhammad wa ali muhammad as i conclude let me just mention one or two points about this tragedy of karbala that we've been going over and lamenting over for the beginning month of muharram that when it comes to ziyarat as we've been talking about tonight and visiting especially the grave of Sayyid al-Shuhada, al Hussein ibn Ali, the master of all of the martyrs from the beginning to the end, that without a doubt one of our greatest tragedies comes when we remember what happened on that day of Ashura and the day after Ashura. Because brothers and sisters, as we had mentioned even on Tuesday night, that after the tragedy of Karbala, it wasn't over. Had the Ahlul Bayt been allowed to go back to Medina, maybe we could have ended the period of grief and lamentation but we know that everything post Karbala was as grief, as difficult to bear for the Ahlul Bayt as the day of Ashura in fact even when we know that the Ahlul Bayt on the 12th of Muharram had left Karbala to go towards Kufa to be in the presence of the cursed Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad that Umar ibn Asad had made them walk through the land of Karbala we're told that as the family of the Prophet, as Bibi Zainab as the fourth Imam are going towards Kufa, that they were intentionally brought through the plains of Karbala, so that once again they would have to see the bodies of their fallen heroes. They would see the headless, lifeless, lifeless bodies of Aba Abdullah. That the fourth Imam would have to lament that the chains on his hands prevent him from burying his father in the state that he sees him in. Eventually, as the Ahlul Bayt get to the city of Kufa, as they get into the area of Kufa and they're walking through the city, the fourth Imam gives a powerful sermon. I'll just mention one line and conclude that as the fourth Imam is walking through Kufa and he begins to offer this one sermon to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, and he begins to introduce himself and he says, For those of you who don't know who I am, I am the son of Hussein, who is the son of Ali. And he begins to talk about his lineage. And he says, I am the one whose father, whose, whose father was left bare and naked and alone on the plains of Karbala. And we remember that on that day of Ashura, when Abu Abdullah had been killed, that it wasn't enough that they killed him and took his life, but that each and every part of his body had been attacked, including the point where somebody saw a ring on the finger of Abu Abdullah. And as they couldn't take the ring off the finger, that man takes out a knife from his pocket and he begins to slice at the hand of Imam Hussein. He removes the finger of Aba Abdullah just to take off the ring that Aba Abdullah had on his hand. We ask Allah for the haq of haq Imam Hussein -Islam to accept this act of worship from us tonight. We ask Allah to allow all of us the tawfiq to make the ziyarat of Arba'in to Aba Abdullah. We ask Allah, if we don't have that chance this year, that for those who have been given the tawfiq, Allah allows them to go and to return back in safety. We ask Allah to hasten the return of our 12th Imam, Imam al-Hujjah, and that we can be worthy of being the helpers and assistants of the Imam, and those to help take the revenge of Karbala uh, through the hand of our 12th Imam, Imam al-Hujjah. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samiul alim. Salu ala Muhammad.